I continue with this series on famous babies in the Bible. And I want you to imagine that one child, just one child could be born and could be used of God to save a nation. Imagine our nation and one child being born that could grow up to be the kind of man through whom God could work in such a mighty way to save this nation. But when we look at this baby, that's what we find. I'd like you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're dealing with the baby, but in reality, we're dealing with how God works and God's promises and the fact that the Lord has a greater interest than any of us ever imagined in our lives and the life of our nation and what we're doing for him. The Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 1, we begin with one verse, verse 20. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. The very name Samuel means I have asked the Lord. God has answered my request. He's in answer to a prayer. Samuel. I want you to remember the name Samuel. If you recall the great people of the Bible, this is one of them that you need to recall. Hold your place here and turn with me, please, to the book of Hebrews. And I want you to see in this list of names that God gives by name in Hebrews chapter 11, that Samuel is mentioned by name, and I want you to have it marked in your Bible, if you would. Remember, this is called the Hall of Faith. And we begin to talk about Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham Isaac, all the way through, and we come to this name in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel and of the prophets. I want you to take the time to mark this name Samuel, Samuel. And then turn back with me if you would. How should we look at this baby? What do we need to know about him? First thing I want you to write down is the peril into which he arrived. The peril into which he arrived. If you study the work of God through the centuries, you find as God began to work through his people, they came to a period of time called the period of the judges. And in the period of the judges, there was a time, the Bible says, as it concludes in the book of Judges, if you'll turn there, please, in Judges chapter 21 and verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. The way this period of time concluded was that every man did what's right in his own eyes. Can you imagine living in a nation where everybody does what's right in his own eyes? We live in a land with a constitution. We live in a land of laws, not personalities. We live in a land where everyone has equal rights under the law. But here God tells us about a time in the work of the people of Israel where Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone was a king to himself. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Think of that. You think that's perilous. God says it is. But worse than that, what was going on among those who represent the Lord in the work of God, in the house of God, in the place where God met with his people was even worse. There was a prophet by the name of Eli. And the Bible tells us his story. I want to read just a part of it. 
because that's where Samuel was growing up. He was taken there. Listen very carefully, please. And the evil sons of Eli. If you go to chapter two of the book of 1 Samuel, and the Bible says, beginning with verse 12, now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. That means sons of the devil. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of thrice teeth in his hand and he struck it into the pan or kittle, a cauldron or pot, all that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also before they burnt the fat, the priest's servants came and said to the man that sacrificed, give flesh to the roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee but raw. And if any man said unto him, let them not fail to burn the fat presently and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Now this is the, the way Samuel and his children were living. Verse 27 of the same chapter, and there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer up mine altar, to burn incense, to wear the ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice at mine offering which I have commanded in my habitation and honor thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel my people wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith I said indeed that thy house and thy house the house of thy father should walk before me forever but now the Lord saith be it far from me for them that honor me, I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house, and thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation in all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be to consume mine eyes and to grieve thine heart and all the increase of thy house shall die in the flower of their age and this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons Hophni and Phinehas in one day they shall die both of them. Now God said I have made my priest to represent me to all the people. And this priest has defied the truth of God and his sons have profaned the work of God. And into that kind of situation, Samuel was born. You say the peril is in the land. The peril was in the land. The persecution that came at the hands of the Philistines was horrible. But the greatest peril was that things were not right with God and God's people. That's the greatest peril. And the greatest peril we face in any nation, in any time, is not just what you see on the news, somebody doing something they shouldn't be doing, but whether or not we are right with God or we're not right with God. That's the greatest peril we face. Now, God said, I'm going to do something about it. He's always at work. In the darkest of times, he's at work. And so there was a child born by the name of Samuel. And Samuel was the very person God used to move the nation from what we call a theocracy, where God was ruling to a monarchy. Samuel was instrumental in two kings that became king, King Saul and 
King David. Samuel was a man God used to bring about great revival in the land. Samuel is the man who started what we call the schools of prophets. Samuel had his heart given to God and Samuel gathered with him men around him and he taught them the things of God. As a matter of fact, the nation would have been lost had not it been for Samuel. But all of this happened in the time of greatest peril. And I'm trying to say to you, I want to encourage you, you may see something that's going wrong. You may see something wrong in the nation. You may say, this is a terrible time for America and we're in great peril. But I want you to know God is still on the throne. God is at work and God is raising up children that he can bless and use to work through to do a mighty work in our land. Think that way. Always think that way. Don't be hopeless and give up. Always think that way. Now the second thing I want you to see is the parents of Samuel. Not only the peril in which he came, but the parents. What kind of people were these? Who were these people? The Bible tells us concerning Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 10, speaking of his mother Hannah, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. This is his mother. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life and there shall no razor come upon his head. Now, she's talking about the Nazarite vow, which means separation to God. The Bible says in verse 19, and they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanai knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. I want you to mark these parents' names. They need to be remembered. The father... Elkanah and the mother Hannah. These were Samuel's parents. Now they lived in these perilous times and she was begging God for a child. She wanted God to bless her with a baby boy. Why? Why do you imagine she wanted a child? Let me ask you mothers, why do you want a child? What does the desire of your heart have to do with it? Many women, maybe most women, have a baby and then try to decide what to do with the child. But that's not the order that Hannah followed. She knew her land was in trouble. She knew her people had forsaken God. She knew it was great peril. And she prayed. And she said, God, I want a baby. I want a baby that's a man-child. And if you give me a baby, a man-child, I will give him back to you. I want to be the vehicle through which you bring a man into this world that can be mightily used of you. I want to be the instrument that you use to bring someone into this world that can be so given to you that you can use that person to make a difference in this world. I wonder how many parents feel that way about their children. You say, I want them to get a good education or I want them to get every opportunity. I want them to live in a nice place. I want them to have friends. I want them to have athletic opportunities or whatever the case may be. But how many of us begin as Christians with the way this woman began and her husband, especially God gives us insight in this mother saying, I want a child so I can give him to you. I want a gift, the greatest gift I can give to you is this child, I want a child that I can give to you, Lord. This is my heart. And that's exactly what she did. And she said, when I get him, he'll be separated to you. That's all I want for him. I want him to be your man. That's all I want for him. Everything you do with him, everything you please to do with him will please me. And the Bible says when this Boy was born, the word of God says in verse 27 of chapter one, for this child I prayed and the Lord hath given me my petition which I ask of him. 
Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth. He should be lent to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there. Now what happened is very simple. The baby was born. She kept the baby until the baby was weaned. Then she carried this boy to a place called Shiloh where the priest lived, where the Ark of the Covenant was found, where God was worshiped and the Lord was represented to all the people from this area. And she took her son Samuel to be with Eli the priest. Now the priest was not all he ought to be. He was a priest for 40 years and his sons were wicked, very wicked men. Hophni and Phinehas. Phinehas' wife gave birth to a baby. Later she named Ichabod, which means the glories departed. When they'd lost battle with the Philistines and everything was in disarray. The people were used to captivity and deliverance and captivity and deliverance and here it goes again. They'd just gone through the period of judges and Samuel was the last of the judges and the first of the prophets in this line of prophets. Though Moses was a prophet at the beginning of the line of prophets. And when she gave him to God, she would come back each year, bring him a little coat. No doubt he was growing and she was caring for him. But nothing pleased her more than to know that her son was given to God. That she had this to give to the Lord. This, this child she had to give to the Lord. Now I said to you earlier that one man made a difference in an entire nation. One person turned the whole country around. We really will never fully realize all that Samuel accomplished. Because as I said earlier, Samuel started these schools of prophets and he trained prophets. He heard from God what God revealed to him and he revealed that to these prophets. We have references in this life of Samuel where Samuel was meeting with these prophets and they were hearing the word of God and learning the word of God and singing songs about the Lord and playing musical instruments and rejoicing in the Lord. Many believe even the man Nathan that came to David later and pointed his finger in David's face when David sinned against Bathsheba and said to David with courageous boldness, thou art the man, was one of the prophets that Samuel trained. But can you imagine a whole generation forgotten God, forgotten the stories of the Bible, forgotten how God delivered his people, forsaken the Lord, oppressed, and captured by enemies, and Samuel had within his heart to teach a school of prophets, men, what he'd been taught. All of that came from his parents. And I want us just to stop for a minute and think, not on what, what we're doing for our children, but what are we desiring for our children? Not what we're doing, but what are we desiring for our children? What do you desire for your children? Most of our children are petted to death. Most of our children in this generation are pampered so, and I'm saying this of myself too. We pamper children so that if they get denied one thing, it upsets the whole family. When I was just a boy growing up, my father told me when I went to school, he said, now son, listen to me. If you get in trouble at school and the teacher has to discipline you, when you come back home that day, I'm going to discipline you also for giving the teacher trouble. How many of you ever heard a parent say that? Some of you older people. Well, that's not what people do today. If children get in trouble at school, the first thing the parent wants to do is call the school and get a meeting with the teacher and say, what has my perfect child done that didn't please you? I've actually been with some teachers, talking with them, counseling with them when some parents have come after them. And I think to myself, you know, friend, you're ruining your children. What is it we're desiring for our children? We think at times we're in perilous times. We even read the scriptures like 2 Timothy chapter three and say in perilous times, these things will happen. And we talk about those things that become commonplace in perilous times. You couldn't have been in more peril than Samuel was in. And the mother asked to have a baby in those perilous times because she wanted to make a difference in those perilous times by giving a child to God so God could use that child to make a difference in the world. 
I wonder how many Christian parents are thinking, the thing I want most for my son or my daughter is for God to use them to make a difference in our land and in our world. How many parents are thinking that way? Oh, may God help us. You think just because you're a Christian. And I've thought that way, that everything's gonna go well. But did you know that Christian parents and Christian children will have more to answer to when they stand before God, more to answer for than any other people in the whole wide world? More. The standard you and I are gonna face when we meet the Lord is not the same standard the unbeliever meets, faces when he or she meets the Lord. We've been given so much more light. These parents in these perilous times, Hannah knew what was needed and so she said, God, give me a child that I can give to you all the days of his life. What does that mean? It certainly means more than bringing a child, though we like to see that and having parents with baby in arms dedicate themselves and that baby to the Lord. Giving a child to God is not just for childhood. It's for all the days of his or her life. And some of the greatest tests parents have who come forward with their children and present their child as an infant and say, church, pray for me. People, pray for me. I want to dedicate this child to the Lord. Some of the greatest tests those parents will have it's when that child is older and nears some stage in life, even into adulthood, where it's our will or God's will for their lives. What we're saying when we give a child to God is we're saying, I want God's will for this child all the days of his life or all the days of her life. It's very difficult for one to judge himself because we want to cast judgment on other people so readily, so easily. It's very difficult for us to judge ourselves. Very difficult. We want to find fault with others. We want to see what's wrong with other people, what people aren't doing right with their children. Well, I think for one moment we need to pause and take inventory of our own lives, put ourselves in the place where these parents, Elkanah and Hannah and little Samuel were, and ask ourselves the question, are our times perilous? Certainly. Maybe, maybe not as perilous as theirs. But what is our desire for our children? Is it a godly desire? Is that what we want first and foremost in their lives? Then there's a third thing I want you to write down. That's the preparation for Samuel. Something happened to him that enabled him to become the man of God that he became. Would you like to know what that is so you can have that same preparation in the life of your children or encourage that in the life of other people who have children? What preparation? Now remember, this is the man who's going to start the schools of prophets that's a forerunner really for colleges and universities and that type of thing. This is the man who's going to anoint David at Bethlehem, king over Israel. This is the man who's going to have to go to Saul after Saul has been anointed king before David becomes king and tells Saul that the judgment of God was upon him. And his kingdom is going to be taken from him. This is a man who's going to have to go through the peril early on of the people saying, we don't want a prophet like you, we want a king. And God says to him, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. This is the man as a young man, as a boy, we imagine, who's gonna to have to go to a priest who's been a priest, who will be a priest for 40 years and say to the priest, God has judged you and judged your sons. And God instructed him to do it. What kind of preparation has been given Samuel that gives him that kind of courage moral fortitude and strength in the Lord. I would to God that every child I know in a Christian home had it. Isn't that a good place for you to say amen? For your children too. So what happened? It's as clear 
as anything could be, I want you to mark it in your Bible. Would you please? Look what the Word of God says in chapter 2 and verse 11. And Elkanah went to Ramah to his house. That's the father. And the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. Not to Eli, but to the Lord. I want you to notice that. He ministered to the Lord. Mark again, please, in verse 18 of the same chapter. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, girded with a linen ephod. Turn to chapter three and verse one. This is his preparation as a child. And the word of God says in chapter three and verse one, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision, meaning it was scarce. It was hard, it was hard. You, you, you didn't hear the word of God. But he ministered to the Lord, he ministered to the Lord, he ministered to the Lord. Again and again and again, God says he ministered to the Lord. Now what does that mean? Normally we think of someone serving the Lord, ministering to the people. That's what you might imagine. You have a pastor and he's here to minister to the people. But it's possible to minister to the people and never really know the Lord. If you have a pastor and the pastor is ministering to the people, listening to the people, asking the people, what do the people want? What do the people say? What do the people complain about? What are the gripes of the people? Oh, let's answer them. Let's minister to the people. Let's hear the people. Let's let the people speak. Let's answer the people. That's like the fellow says, I'm gonna look out the window and see which way the parade is going so I can go out and lead them. You know? It's not about ministering to the people and listening to the people. That's the most difficult thing in the world for the minister and the people to learn. It's about ministering to the Lord, listening to the Lord, letting the Lord speak and coming to know what the Lord wants and obeying the Lord. If I live until August, I will have been in the ministry of the Lord for 50 years. And I don't know of anything that's been more difficult with which to deal than this one thing trying to make sure we please the people. We do what the people want or make sure first and foremost we listen to the Lord and do what the Lord wants. Now, when you're in your right mind and I'm in my right mind as a Christian, you would say, I want our pastor to listen to the Lord. I know that. And I want our pastor to know the Lord and I want our pastor to know what the Lord wants and I want him to do what the Lord wants him to do. I want him to be able to stand before God, not just someday, someplace, sometime. I want him to be able to stand before God at the end of every day and say, I've obeyed the Lord today. And then we come and say, I'm just pleased. We find he's found God's direction and he leads us. And honestly, as you pray and seek the Lord, the same Holy Spirit who is not confused at all would lead you the same way he'd lead me. No doubt about it. It's about dying to self and allowing the Lord's work to be done. Now, a lot of things go on here. We have more than 120 different ministries. Someone talked to me recently about the jail ministry. We're in all the jails in Knox County and most all of them in Anderson County. Someone has talked to me recently about our school ministry. We're in 41 public schools. All the Knox County schools, high schools, middle schools. We're in all the nursing homes. To my knowledge, if there's a nursing home we're not in, I don't know what it is. Over 40 nursing homes, nursing home ministries, ministering to the senior citizens in those nursing homes. We visit all the hospitals. There's not a hospital in Knoxville we don't visit or Knox County. And we're in all those hospitals, nearly every one of them every day. I'm thinking, I'm not trying to brag about anything, I'm just trying to tell you, there are many voices, many voices. 
We have 160 Bible classes outside of our church during the week. Think of that. And all of them have a voice. Now here Samuel came into a nation that had lost contact with God. If you ask the young people in Samuel's day about the great stories of the Bible, they wouldn't know them. If you ask the young men in Samuel's day, tell us about how God delivered his people from Egyptian bondage. They wouldn't know the story. They'd been cut off from their history. Sound familiar with our day? So what is the greatest preparation a Christian child needs? If he or she has been given to God to serve the Lord, they have to learn how to listen to God and minister to God and hear God's voice and know what God wants. Because the devil's biggest work is a work of deception. The devil can make something look just exactly like somebody wants it to look and think that's the way to go when it's exactly the opposite of what we should do. He's a deceiver. That's how he's had his entire career as a deceiver. But what is the mind of God? What does God want? What does God say? How is God leading? So if the Lord's gonna straighten out the whole nation, he's gonna change the direction of his people back to where God wants it to be. He speaks to Samuel. Samuel organizes the school of prophets. He reveals to the prophets what God's revealed to him. They're out preaching it. He's bringing back the history of God's people to the people of God. He's telling them again the great stories of how God's delivered them. But why is he able to do that? There's got to be something at the heart of all of this. Some way, something at the beginning of it as a child, even among the wicked people at the tabernacle, Eli and his sons, he learned how to get alone with God and know the mind of God, know what God wanted, how God was speaking, how God was leading, and had a heart to obey the Lord. I'm just reading part of the life story of Margaret Thatcher and who was once Prime Minister of England. She's now with the Lord, I believe a real Christian. Margaret Thatcher said when she was 11 years old, she came home and told her father what her friends were doing and how she wanted to join them. And her father said to her, Never follow the crowd. Don't be ashamed to stand alone. That was an 11-year-old, 12-year-old child. And there were times in her career as prime minister when she had to go the exact opposite direction of the crowd and find out what she believed was God's direction for her nation and for her people. That's just a modern illustration. But no one will ever make the difference that needs to be made in life till he or she knows how to hear from God and listen to God and let God give them direction. So the prayer that you need to pray for me and the prayer I need to pray for you is the same prayer. Learn how to minister to the Lord. His preparation was ministering to the Lord, ministering to the Lord, ministering to the Lord. Not seeing what was a buzz about the tabernacle. What did God want? What direction did God have? What was it that would please the Lord? What did God have to say? And that's at the root of all of this. So when we look at baby Samuel and we see all the mighty things that Samuel accomplished, as a one man instrument in God's hand to turn a nation back to God. We can go back to his childhood with just a little boy in the tabernacle in Shiloh in perilous times, learning 
how to personally minister to the Lord, how to spend time with God, how to hear from God, how to let God speak to him and give him direction. And beloved, we have a completed written revelation of God's word now. And our greatest work, our greatest work with our children will be to bring our children to the place where they know the Lord and rely on God's word and learn how to minister to the Lord and let God direct their lives. There's no telling what they might become or do for his glory if they learn that one thing. Let's get our priorities right. Perilous times? Oh, yes. Parents? That's how we get here. The difference is these parents prayed and asked God and said, if you give us a child, we know the reason you've given us a child is so we can give him to you. And we not only will give him to you, we'll teach him and instruct him and help him and how he can minister to the Lord and hear your voice and let you speak to him. I want that for my children and my grandchildren. You want that for your children, your grandchildren? May God help us. Let's pray together, may we?